All right, highly anticipated Prime card has now come and gone. And overall, I'd have to say it was interesting. Don't get me wrong, there were some amazing moments on this card, some really like legitimately great fights. Not just good for a couple influencer boxers, but like actually legitimate good fights. The huge momentum shift that happened in Salt Poppy versus Slim, resulting in the fan favorite Salt Poppy getting knocked out. Wally Sharks versus Dean the Great 2, which at this point, this is just a boxing match. These guys are way too skilled for us to call them influencer boxers at this point. And while yes, there were a couple of duds in this card, I'd say heading into the main event, this was a really fun night of fights. And then we get to the highly anticipated co-main event or first main event or whatever they want to call it between Dylan Dennis and Logan Paul. Now look, retroactively, a lot of people are trying to paint a different narrative on this fight. But I mean, if we're being honest, this fight went just about exactly as everyone thought it would. I think there was so much hype in the build up to this fight that it kind of took away from the reality of the situation, which is that this is the classic Paul Brothers boxing match where they come in with every advantage you can possibly think of, weight, height, reach, experience. Conveniently, there was no pre-fight drug testing. And then of course, the hand-picked opponent this time was Dylan Danis, a guy who has never even shown any prowess as a striker in MMA. And oh, by the way, he's coming off of not one, but two knee reconstruction surgeries. If you watched my breakdown of this fight that I put out a couple weeks ago, this went exactly as expected. Logan being the bigger guy and the more experienced boxer was able to effectively outbox Dylan for the entire fight. Now, a part of that was Dylan's strategy going into this fight was that he was just going to go out there and wait for Logan to gas out. And in doing that, he was going to take as many shots as he needed to take before ideally putting on the pressure in the later rounds. And as expected, when things didn't go his way, he started mixing in some grappling. Now, one thing I mentioned in my pre-fight prediction video that I didn't see anyone else mention was that while yes, Dylan is a grappler, he's an MMA guy, and yes, he also fights at 170, but the guy is no Ben Askren. He's younger, more tenacious, and considerably more durable. And even though Dylan's punching output in this one was disgustingly low, he still was able to land a couple good shots. Now for Logan, I was not impressed really at all. I think that Logan looked fine, but when you're going up against a guy who you have every advantage over, in addition to all the pre-fight hype on both sides, Dylan doing everything possible to wake up a monster within Logan, and Logan screaming about how the fight's gonna end by first round decapitation, cruising to a decision victory where you never really land and anything meaningful ends up being pretty underwhelming. We still saw Logan get a little too excited in there, throwing the slappy punches, very similar to what we saw in the Mayweather fight. And Logan did land a couple pretty big shots on Dylan, but again, at no point was Dylan in any kind of serious danger in this match. And I know on one hand, you can say that, yeah, it's hard to get a knockout against a guy who's not really coming to fight. But at the same time, Dylan was walking forward for literally the entire fight. I think the logical conclusion we can come to after this is that Dylan does have a decent chin but at the same time, Logan does not have the kind of punching power that you'd expect for somebody who's built like that. Now, I know a lot of people are taking this time to go back to shitting on Dylan Danis because the quote unquote real fighter lost to the quote unquote YouTuber. But let's be honest, between the buildup for this fight that was single-handedly all Dylan, the in-ring antics, and the obscene amount of interviews, media work, and podcasts that Dylan did up to this fight to increase the fan interest, Dylan did single-handedly make this one of the most anticipated fights of the entire year, which is insane. It's, it's crazy that I'm even saying that, but it's true. And that alone is fucking impressive. Dylan did, of course, go for the double leg takedown and he went for the guillotine. I know some people out there that don't have any grappling experience are taking this time to try to dunk on Dylan Danis because, oh, you didn't get the double leg takedown. Oh, you didn't get the guillotine. But at the end of the day, it's a boxing match with boxing gloves. You can't exactly grapple with boxing gloves. It's the whole reason the gloves in MMA are different. I think Dylan was more just trying to put on a show with that stuff, more so than actually turn it into an MMA match. But I don't want to take anything away from Logan. At the end of the day he showed up and he did enough to win the fight and yes he should win this fight right with everything stacked in his favor but i'd be lying if i said it wasn't at least a little bit impressive that he was able to go out there with somewhat of a clear mind get the job done when if he would have lost this fight yeah, this would have been the biggest hit to his image possible so what's next realistically i shouldn't be asking that we should already know what's next because we saw these two on camera agree to and shake on a rematch in mma assuming that dylan showed up which he did Tell you what, if you show up to this fight, yeah. October 14th, yeah. I will rematch you in MMA. Good. 
But of course, in typical Paul brother fashion, Logan has now retroactively decided that that handshake agreement that was called on camera that we all saw is actually now dependent on Dylan giving Logan his entire purse. I know you guys talked about MMA. Do you have any interest in rematching him in MMA? If Dylan pays me his whole purse like he agreed. So long story short, we're not going to see that because Logan probably knows that that's not going to go too well for him. But I think Dylan going for the takedown going for the guillotine. And though they were kind of like half-assed attempts in all honesty, the fact that he didn't just straight up annihilate Logan with a takedown attempt has got a lot of people thinking that an MMA match between the two would actually be pretty competitive. So this is definitely, in my opinion, what the fans want to see. But it looks like Logan's management team is now pushing him away from boxing again anytime soon. And now that Dylan's actually got back out there, gotten into some competition, I'd like to see him get back in the cage, fighting some MMA. And I think with the amount of hype that he was able to build into this fight, I I honestly think a lot of MMA organizations are gonna wanna bring him in to at the very least capitalize on the kind of excitement, the amount of eyeballs that he's gonna be able to generate. So at the end of the day, Dylan didn't get turned into a meme. He did better than Ben Askren, which is, I guess not really saying that much, but considering how a lot of people viewed him as just another Ben Askren, it means something. Dylan was able to land a couple shots. So I know he's gonna have all the fun in the world posting those clips on Twitter. And as for Logan, he was able to get the win, so he's not turned into a meme. So I think both guys, kind of come out of this relatively unscathed. And then now the main event, the fight that definitely got dwarfed by the insane amount of hype of the co-main event, KSI and Tommy Fury. Purpose of this fight was to prove whether or not JJ is as good, if not better, or if he's worse than Jake Paul. And I would say that all the questions that we had about how good JJ actually is were answered immediately. Like I said in my preview video for this fight, JJ's really unorthodox karate-like style with a bouncing in and out footwork proved to be very confusing for Tommy Fury, the more traditionally trained boxer. And JJ made it a point to bring up the fact that he was the faster fighter in there and that Tommy's gonna be unprepared for the kind of pressure and pace that JJ puts on him. And he was kind of right. JJ was able to dart in and out very fast, land a bunch of huge huge right hands. KSI definitely took the first round of this fight. Second round was a weird one because JJ, I don't know if he was acting, right? I mean, far be it for me to say that somebody is pretending that they got smashed in the back of the head because that is pretty serious. We have seen some pretty gruesome injuries come out of boxing from guys that got hit in the back of the head. But I think there might've been a little bit of gamesmanship there to get that point taken away from Tommy. Once I saw that they took that point away, which I thought was a little bit much, I think he only hit him in the back of the head a couple of times. And by the way, let's not pretend that JJ wasn't hitting Tommy in the back of the head and the clinch as well. But once they took that point away, I thought that JJ might actually win this fight. From there on, this fight became a complete clinch fest and we have to call it how it is. A lot of that is because of JJ's darting in and out footwork. Because JJ is so green as a boxer, his punches aren't always the most accurate. So if he's darting in, putting all of his power, putting all of his momentum into a right hand and it misses, he's gonna basically throw himself into a clinch, which is what happened over and over and over. They both landed some in tight shots in the clinch. But overall, the fight basically played out by Tommy Fury landing a couple jabs, JJ coming in with a big right hand, either landing or missing, ending up in the clinch. So the only difference maker that you can point to from rounds two through six was the fact that Tommy was constantly putting the pressure on KSI, landing some jabs, and he was trying to box. And I think because of that, Tommy Fury effectively outboxed KSI for the vast majority of the fight. So a lot of people are calling this a robbery. No, I don't think this is a robbery at all whatsoever. And to be honest, I think it's pretty irresponsible for JJ in the post-fight interview to call this a robbery and to show really no sportsmanship. Very reminiscent of Jake Paul's loss to Tommy Fury, where immediately afterwards he comes out with every excuse known to man, and he can't accept the fact that on this night he got outboxed. I think when it comes to the highest level of influencer boxing, these guys have massive followings online. They're so used to being able to completely curate their image that they get a little immature when and they lose and it's because of something that's out of their control. I honestly believe that these guys, the Paul brothers, KSI, have actually done a good job at getting a lot of young people interested in boxing. But when you see these guys borderline throw a fit after a loss, I think they're setting a terrible example for some of the younger kids that they're getting into boxing. I know KSI is now going to appeal this decision and I don't think that that's gonna work at all. Like in my opinion, if there's any part of this fight that should be appealed, it's taking the point away from Tommy 
Tommy right away for a shot to the back of the head when JJ's also landing shots to the back of the head. At most, I could understand calling this fight a draw, but at the end of the day, I think the reason so many people see this as a robbery is because KSI did so much better than what we expected. But having the crowd on your side, having them erupt every time that you land a single punch, that's not enough to get the nod on the judges' scorecards. That being said, this was a way closer fight than it should have been. For someone of Tommy Fury's level, he still has some glaring holes in his game, smothering his punches, having a hard time stringing together combinations that actually land. Though I feel like Tommy won this fight, if he wants to go forward in boxing, he definitely has a long way to go. So what's next? I actually think this fight ended up in the best case scenario for all parties involved. The reason KSI took this fight is because he wanted to prove that he is a better boxer than Jake Paul. And at the end of the day, he performed considerably better than Jake did. So while he might not have gotten the victory, the point is still proven. Tommy Fury, he gets another victory. He doesn't have to go home with a loss in his record to a guy that just boxes for fun. And currently, we know that Jake Paul does not have an opponent. I would say that the hype for a KSI versus Jake Paul fight is now at an all-time high. So at the end of the day, realistically, everybody kind of got what they wanted. But at the end of the day, a lot of people are shitting on this card right now. I had a lot of fun watching it. Not all the fights were extremely entertaining. But altogether, I think that Misfits did a good job of putting on a card that at the very least had matchups that so many people were looking forward to seeing. And shout out to all the guys that are already making comfortable livings with their social media followings that still take the chance to put their health on the line just to entertain us. Thanks for watching.